Stories, fables, ghostly tales. The story of Tuan Mac Kyril. It is the continuation of the last episode where I covered chapters 1 through to 5. So if you're coming in halfway, you might want to bounce back one episode. And in this half of the story, we learn more about Tuan Mac Carell's genealogy and past lives. Without keeping you waiting, let's jump right in. There I dreamed, and I saw myself changing into a stag in dream. And I felt in dream the beating of a new heart within me. And in dream, I arched my neck and braced my powerful limbs. I awoke from the dream, and I was that which I had dreamed. I stood a while stamping upon a rock, with my bristling head swung high, breathing through wide nostrils all the savour of the world. For I had come marvellously from decrepitude to strength. I had writhed from the bonds of age, and was young again. I smelled the turf and knew for the first time how sweet that smelled, and like lightning, my moving nose sniffed all things to my heart and separated them into knowledge. Long I stood there, wringing my iron hoof on stone and learning all things through my nose. Each breeze that came from the right hand or the left brought me a tail. A wind carried me the tang of wolf and against that smell I stared and stamped. And on a wind there came the scent of my own kind and at that I belled. Oh, loud and clear and sweet was the voice of the great stag. With what ease my lovely note went lilting. With what joy I heard the answering call. With what delight I bounded, 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 light as a bird's plume, powerful as a storm, untiring as the sea. Here now was ease in ten yard springings, with the swinging head, with the rise and fall of a swallow, with the curve and flow and urge of an otter of the sea, what a tingle dwelt about my heart, what a thrill spun to the lofty points of my antlers, how the world was new, how the sun was new, how the wind caressed me. With unswerving forehead and steady eye, I met all that came. The old lone wolf leapt sideways, snarling and slunk away. The lumbering bear swung his head of hesitations and thought again. He trotted his small red eye away with him to a nearby break. The stag of my race fled from my rocky forehead, or were pushed back and back until their legs broke under them, and I trampled them to death. I was the beloved, the well-known, the leader of the herds of Ireland, and at times I came back from my boundings about Ire. For the strings of my heart were drawn to Ulster, and, standing away, my wide nose took the air, while I knew with joy, with terror, that men were blown on the wind. A proud head hung to the turf then, and the tears of memory rolled from a large, bright eye. At times I drew near, delicately, standing among thick leaves, or crouched in long-grown grasses, and I stared and mourned as I looked on men. Four Nemed and four couples had been saved from that fierce storm. And as I saw them increase and multiply until four thousand couples lived and laughed and were riotous in the sun. For the people of Nemed had small minds but great activity. They were savage fighters and hunters. But one time I came, drawn by that intolerable anguish of memory, and all of these people were gone. The place that knew them was silent. In the land where they had moved, there was nothing of them but their bones that glinted in the sun. Old age came on me there. Among these bones, weariness crept into my limbs. My head grew heavy, my eyes dim. My knees jerked and trembled, and there the wolves dared chase me. I went again to the cave that had been my home when I was an old man. One day I stole from the cave to snatch a mouthful of grass, for I was closely besieged by wolves. They made their rush, and I barely escaped from them. They sat beyond the cave staring at me. I knew their tongue, 
I knew all that they said to each other, and all that they said to me. But there was yet a thud left in my forehead, a deadly trample in my hoof. They did not dare come into the cave. Tomorrow, they said, we will tear out your throat and gnaw on your living haunch. Chapter 7 Then my soul rose to the height of doom, and I intended all that might happen to me, and agreed to it. Tomorrow, I said, I will go out among ye and I will die. And at that the wolves howled joyfully, hungrily, impatiently. I slept. I saw myself changing into a boar in dream, and I felt in dream the beating of a new heart within me. And in dream, I stretched my powerful neck and braced my eager limbs. I awoke from my dream, and I was that which I had dreamed. The night wore away, the darkness lifted, the day came. And from without the cave, the wolves called to me. Come out, O oh skinny stag. Come out and die. And I, with joyful heart, thrust a black bristle through the hole of the cave. And when they saw that wriggling snout, those curving tusks, that red, fierce eye, the wolves fled, yelping, tumbling over each other, frantic with terror, and I behind them, a wild cat for leaping, a giant for strength, and a devil for ferocity, a madness and gladness of lusty, unsparing life, a killer, a champion, a boar who could not be defied. I took the lordship of the boars of Ireland. Wherever I looked among my tribe, I saw love and obedience. Whenever I appeared among the strangers, they fled away. And the wolves feared me then, and the great grim bear went bounding on heavy paws. I charged him at the head of my troop and rolled him over and over. But it is not easy to kill the bear. So deeply is his life packed under that stinking pelt. He picked himself up and ran, and was knocked down, and ran again blindly, butting into trees and stones. Not a claw did the big bear flash, not a tooth did he show. As he ran whimpering like a baby, or as he stood with my nose rammed against his mouth, snarling up into his nostrils. I challenged all that moved, all creatures but one. For men had again come to Ireland, Simeon, the son of Sariath, from whom the men of Daman and the fair Bolg and the Galuin are descended. These I did not chase, and when they chased me, I fled. Often I would go, drawn by my memoried heart, to look at them as they moved among their fields, and I spoke to my mind in bitterness. When the people of Parthalon were gathered in council, my voice was heard. It was sweet to all who heard it, and the words I spoke were wise. The eyes of women brightened and softened when they looked at me. They loved to hear him when he sang, who now wanders in the forest with a tusky herd. Chapter 8 Old age again overtook me. Weariness stole into my limbs and anguish dozed into my mind. I went to my Ulster cave and dreamed my dream, and I changed into a hawk. I left the ground. The sweet air was my kingdom, and my bright eyes stared on a hundred miles. I soared, I swooped, I hung, motionless as a living stone, over the abyss. I lived in joy and slept in peace, and had my fill of sweetness of life. During that time, Beothach, the son of Arbanel, the prophet, came to Ireland with his people, and there was a great battle between his men and the children of Semyon. Long I hung over that combat, seeing every spear that hurtled, every stone that whizzed from a sling, every sword that flashed up and down, and the endless glittering of the shields. And at the end I saw that the victory was with Iabanel, and from his people, the Tuatha Dé and the Andé came. Although their origin is forgotten, and learned people, because of their excellent wisdom and intelligence, 
say that they came from heaven. These are the people of Faerie. All these are the gods. For long, long years I was a hawk. I knew every hill and stream, every field and glen of Ireland. I knew the shape of cliffs and coasts, and how all places looked under the sun or moon. And I was still a hawk when the sons of Mill drove the Tuatha De, the nun, under the ground, and held Ireland against arms or wizardry. And this was the coming of men and the beginning of genealogies. Then I grew old, and in my Ulster cave close to the sea I dreamed my dream, and in it I became a salmon. The green tides of ocean rose over me and my dream, so that I drowned in the sea and did not die. For I awoke in deep waters, and I was that which I dreamed. I had been a man, a stag, a boar, a bird, and now I was a fish. In all my changes I had joy and fullness of life. But in the water joy lay deeper, life pulsed deeper. For on land, on air, there is always something excessive and hindering as arms that swing at the side of a man, and which the mind must remember. The stag has legs to be tucked away for sleep, and untucked for movement, and the bird has wings that must be folded and pecked and cared for. But the fish has but one piece from his nose to his tail. He is complete, single, and unencumbered. He turns in one turn, and goes up and down and around in one soul movement. How I flew through the soft element, how I joyed in the country where there is no harshness, in the elements which upholds and gives way, which caresses and lets go, and will not let you fall, for man may stumble in a furrow, the stag tumble from a cliff, the hawk wing weary and beaten, with darkness around him and the storm behind, may dash his brains against a tree. But the home of the salmon is his delight, and the sea guards all her creatures. Chapter 9 I became the king of the salmon, and with my multitudes I ranged on the tides of the world. Green and purple distances were under me, green and gold the sunlight regions above. In these latitudes I moved through a world of amber, myself amber and gold, in those others, in a sparkle of lucent blue, I curved, lit like a living jewel, and in these again, through dusks of ebony all made with silver, I shot and shone the wonder of the sea. I saw the monsters of the utmost ocean go heaving by, and the long lithe brutes that are toothed to their tails, and below were gloom dipped down on gloom, vast, livid tangles that coiled and uncoiled, and lapsed down steeps and hells of the sea, where even the salmon could not go. I knew the secret caves where ocean roars to ocean, the floods that are icy cold, from which the nose of a salmon leaps back as at a sting, and the warm streams in which we rocked and dozed and were carried forward without motion. I swam on the outermost rim of the great world, where nothing was but the sea and the sky, and the salmon. Where even the wind was silent, and the water was clear as clean grey rock. And then, far away in the sea, I remembered Ulster, and there came on me an instant, uncontrollable anguish to be there. I turned, and through days and nights I swam tirelessly, jubilantly, with terror wakening in me too, and a whisper, through my being that I must reach Ireland or die. I fought my way to Ulster from the sea. Ah, how that end of the journey was hard. A sickness was racking in every one of my bones, a languor and weariness creeping through my every fibre and muscle. The waves held me back and held me back. The soft waters seemed to have grown hard, and it was as though I were urging through a rock as I strained towards Ulster from the sea. So tired I was. I could have loosened my frame and been swept away. I could have slept and been drifted and wafted away, swinging on grey-green billows that had turned from the land and were heaving and mounting and surging to the far blue water. 
Only the unconquerable heart of the salmon could brave that end of toil. The sound of the rivers of Ireland racing down to the sea came to me in the last numb effort. The love of Ireland bore me up. The gods of the river trod to me in the white curled breakers, so that I left the sea at long, long last, and I lay in sweet water in the curve of a crannied rock, exhausted, three parts dead, triumphant. Chapter 10 The light and strength came to me again, and now I explored all the inland ways, the great lakes of Ireland and her swift brown rivers. What a joy to lie under an inch of water basking in the sun, or beneath a shady ledge to watch the small creatures that speed like lightning on the rippling top. I saw the dragonflies flash and dart and turn with a poise, with a speed that no other winged thing knows. I saw the hawk hover and stare and swoop. He fell like a falling stone, but he could not catch the king of the salmon. I saw the cold-eyed cat stretching along a bow level with the water, eager to hook and lift the creatures of the river. And I saw men. They saw me also. They came to know me and look for me. They lay in wait at the waterfalls up, which I leapt like a silver flash. They held out nets for me. They hid traps under leaves. They made cords of the color of water, of the color of of weeds. But this salmon had a nose that knew how a weed felt and a string felt. They drifted meat on a sightless string, but I knew of the hook. They thrust spears at me, and threw lances which they drew back again with a cord. Many a wound I got from men, many a sorrowful scar. Every beast pursued me in the waters and along the banks, the barking, black-skinned otters came after me in lost and gust and swirl. The hawk and the steeped-winged, spear-beaked birds dived down on me. And men crept on me with nets the width of a river. So that I got no rest. My life became a ceaseless scurry and wound and escape. A burden and anguish of watchfulness. And then I was caught. The fisherman of Kyril, the king of Ulster, took me in his net. Ah, that was a happy man when he saw me. He shouted for joy when he saw the great salmon in his net. I was still in the water as he hauled, delicately. And I was still in the water as he pulled me to the bank. My nose touched air, and spun from it as from fire. I dived with all my might against the bottom of the net, holding yet to the water. Loving it, mad with terror, that I must quit that loveliness. But the net held, and I came up. Be quiet, king of the river, said the fisherman. Give in to doom, said he. I was in air, and it was as though I were in fire. The air pressed on me like a fiery mountain. It beat on my scales and scorched them. It rushed down my throat and scalded me. It weighed on me and squeezed me, so that my eyes felt as though they must burst from my head, my head as though it would leap from my body, and my body as though it would swell and expand and fly in a thousand pieces. The light blinded me. The heat tormented me. The dry air made me shrivel and gasp, and as he lay on the grass, the great salmon whirled his desperate nose once more to the river, and leaped, leaped and leaped even under the mountain of air. He could leap upward but not forwards, and yet he leaped, for in each rise he could see the twinkling waves, the rippling and curling waters. Be at ease, O king, said the fisherman. Be at rest, my beloved. Let go the stream. Let the oozy marge be forgotten, and the sandy bed where the shades dance and the brown floods sings long. And as he carried me to the palace, he sang a song of the river, and a song of doom, and a song in praise of the king of the waters. When the king's wife saw me, she desired me. I was put over a fire and roasted, 
and she ate me. And when time passed, she gave birth to me, and I was her son, and the son of Kyril the king. I remember warmth and darkness and movement and unseen sounds. All that happened, I remembered, from the time I was on the gridiron until the time I was born. I forget nothing of these things. And now, said Finian, you will be born again, for I shall baptize you into the family of the living God. So far the story of Tuan, the son of Kyril. No man knows if he died in those distant ages when Finian was abbot of Moville, or if he still keeps his fort in Ulster, watching all things, and remembering them for the glory of God and the honour of Ireland. And this concludes the story of Tuan Mac Kyril. I hope you all enjoyed this story. I found this absolutely riveting. I don't think I've read anything like this yet, at least of this time frame, the 1920s. I really enjoyed the adventure of the fish and the descriptions about living in the water. The deer, the bird, the man adventures of Tuan, they're all great, but I've never really had the perspective of a fish, the salmon of all creatures, explained and expressed in such a way. It's stories like this that make me appreciate the hidden beauty in as scary a place as the sea, and interpret a completely new and unique perspective to what it means to be a fish. Here I am ranting about a fish. <laughs> but you can see, the story of Tuan Mac Kyril definitely made an impact. Did it have an impact on you too? And which animal form would you take? If you could pick the man, the bird, the stag, or the fish, or the boar, dare I forget the boar, which one would you pick? I gotta say, for me, it would be, this is tough, uh, between the stag and the boar, but knowing how it feels to be a human, of course, human is a smart choice. But if I had to pick another animal besides the human, I'd pick the boar. Yeah, lock it in. Definitely the boar. Strength, ferocity, and durability. So I was going to go into the next story on Friday, The Boyhood of Fionn. But I'll wait for your feedback. If you guys and gals really enjoyed this episode, let me know. Just shoot me an email at storiesfablesghostlytales at gmail.com or leave some comment in the SoundCloud or get hold of me on Facebook with a short message. And from those comments, I'll make my decision. Whether it's creepypasta, no sleep, or some Irish folktales. Or even some Japanese folktales. But either way, I'll come to a decision. Now this Friday, I may or may not have an episode up only because I won't be at a computer or have access to computers for about two to three days, which means uploading is going to be a little bit trickier, but I'll do my best to get an episode to you. If I get some time, I'll definitely pre-record one and upload them. But if you don't hear from me on Friday, you'll definitely hear from me on Monday. So have a fantastic morning, drink copious amounts of coffee and or tea, so cram as much of those delicious liquids into your body, and for those who are about to go to sleep, I hope you have a lovely evening and a dream about the fairy and Irish folk tales. As always, my lovely listeners, till next time. time.